Hey, welcome, folks. And take me down just a bit. Thank you. My name's Eric, and I want to welcome you to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I'm going to just gush for a couple minutes so we can start at noon on the dot. This organization has gone through a lot of changes, and I want to remind you all, if you visit the website, WashingtonCountyForum.org, you would see that this organization has operated continuously since 1956, and it has been the entity, the forum of record for Washington County. I am just amazed by the history of the people who have attended, better yet, the people who have served this organization. And I would like to perpetuate something I just saw, and that is we have a, a new member. And uh, he just wrote a check, so I'm going to read his name off the check. Mr. Platt, thank you for joining. <laughs> Welcome. Very briefly, I'd like to recognize any electeds. If you're, if you're elected to office, stand up and be recognized. Yay! In addition to uh, pitching membership, I'd like to enforce something that my members have really asked me to do, and that is only members get to ask questions during the program. You're welcome to arrive early and hang out late and intercept people. We kind of have that narrow doorway set up for a purpose so you can intercept them, and which is your right. But I ask that only people with blue name tags that are paid members in good standing get to ask questions. That's important. One of the things that uh, under my tenure we've done is that we've lowered dues. And after a chat this, this last week with John Tyner, our past president, the forum has a bank account balance of almost $7,000. And in years past, it's been only a fraction of that. And what I'd like to do explain, I'd like to explain to you how we got there in partnership with the Aloha Community Library, which is gonna move in this building in the old National Guard space, a donation was made for the video camera up there, which we use to broadcast this on cable access and get the forum's message out to the people to help them decide public issues. We had a matching grant for $2,900, so that video camera became a fixed asset that's depreciable for the Aloha Library. Through fiscal alchemy, it became another $2,900 worth of cold, hard cash. And then we've checked this out to the forum, and this helped us fluff up our bank account balance because we were able to do something equally as wonderful. For years, the Public Affairs Forum had struggled with a big cable access bill, and Twalton Valley Community Television is a wonderful partner, but this small organization based on dues just didn't have the horsepower to keep that bill paid. We no longer have that bill, but we still submit programming thanks to partnerships with the Aloha Community Library. And that also happened with another wonderful thing in that this organization turned into a training organization. So we actually have interns now learning skills such as podcasting, television production, sound production, website development. And that really was a long-term dream that has gelled and become reality for this organization. So since 1956, uh, we've been going, we've been doing it, and we want to do it some more. So thank you, members, for being here. Uh, I'd like to close my remarks with a pitch, and that is that those wonderful things I just described have been with the help of our amazing board. So I ask that if you're on the board of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum, you stand up. These are, these are the people that make it work. How about a round of applause for them? Thank you, board. They do some heavy lifting, and it, uh, only with their help does that allow me to, to remark on these fantastic things that have occurred. I'd like to get this uh, meeting started in about 30 seconds at 12 on the dot. And John McWilliams, yeah, yes, please. Do you want to do the protocol? OK, uh, thank you. Uh, first up, we're going to have county chairs, Andy Dyke. First, Ellen Amabiska, second. And then at 12.30, we're going to pivot to the House District 34 races. And the three candidates that are here and their order is as follows, Brian Toski, Jason Yergel, and Ken Helm. So what I'd like to do is now start introducing for cable access. Welcome to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I'm Eric, your president. And we're going to have up Andy Dyke and Ellen Amabiska for the county chair races. So. Uh, Andy, you have eight minutes, followed by Alan, you'll have eight minutes, and then for the balance of the half an hour, we'll take questions at this microphone. Uh, how about a round of applause for County Chair Andy Dyke? Thank you.
Oh, oh, and Marilyn okay. McWilliams oh. here is your timer. She'll hold up cards for all candidates, and uh, please honor her, her okay. signals. Well, I know Mar Marilyn well, and I'll be looking. Well, first of all, happy uh, St. Patrick's Day. I see lots of green in the crowd here. Good that you're all in the spirit. I'm very proud of Washington County. Over this past year, uh, it, was, it was said in the, I believe it was the Beaverton Valley Times, that Washington County is the greatest place or the happiest place on earth. And frankly, um, I tend to agree with that. In fact, I believe my opponent also agrees, which is why he moved back here from out of state. But uh, Washington County has a history of balancing farmland protection, economic development, livability, and fiscal responsibility. And you'll notice that I'm wearing my jobs pin today. Four years ago, we were in the depths of a recession. And I ran for this, this seat, and like so many other people who were running for, for office, we were all wearing a jobs pin. That was what was on everybody's mind back then. Uh, we needed employment desperately, and I promised four things to help, uh, to help keep the county on the right track. First of all was to continue to foster an environment where companies could grow and thrive, to have fiscal responsibility and rebuild our budgetary reserves, to continue to work with... Uh, Commissioner Terry, who was running for election at that time, and the Land Use Department to reduce bureaucratic red tape. And also to have open communications between governments and an open door policy to meet with all groups of various viewpoints. Now I filled those promises, which has resulted in very low unemployment. I believe we're about at 5.8% and continuing to decline. Reserve funds are now standing at uh, nearly 20%, and the permitting department has been uh, revamped in a way that we often get compliments on our customer service. And that's pretty unusual for a department like that. But uh, it's something that we strove to achieve and we did. Referring to the open door policy, I met with many groups to help formulate the urban and rural reserves plan. My opponent preferred instead to litigate. By doing so, he succeeded in shutting off the voices of hundreds of individuals who testified on reserves. Now that's not the way a chair of Washington County, the most affluent county in the state of Oregon, should behave. It needs to be much more collaborative than that. I can't say that as chair that I, that I helped to uh, satisfy all voices. I certainly didn't or there would have been no litigation. But together with my colleagues and two other boards of commissioners on two other counties, with Metro and with LCDC, we create, crafted uh, a plan that was the best that we could get under the circumstances and, uh, and promoted that. And I would hope that anybody who's in a chair position would have the balance that it takes to make that happen. We've also begun a conversation about how we better support the mental, excuse me, uh, let me back up a bit. I wanna talk a little bit about what I've done and what I will continue to do for Washington County now. The county will continue to play a role in supporting education through partnerships involving school-based health centers, early learning councils, and yes, sometimes even financial help. Sometimes that's direct, but mostly what the county does is create economic development so that, that we help raise revenue at the state level because it is a state responsibility. And I will continue to do that as I have done in the past. I've also begun a conversation about we, how we can better support the mentally ill. From teens who struggle with mental illness in school, to veterans returning from service, to those incarcerated in our jails. We could spend money up front for prevention that would end up uh, saving us money down the road on homelessness, crime, uh, addiction treatment, and other, other services. So to that end, we're just completing a study that will inform us of the true costs of homelessness and mental illness so that we can get a, out ahead of those complicated issues. Regarding transportation, always a big challenge in Washington County and will continue to be. We have a big task ahead of us. The voters in Tigard have passed an anti-high capacity uh, measure and we're still analyzing what that means. But the problem of traffic congestion remains. Just because they passed that measure does not mean that the problem goes away. We will continue to work with our partners, TriMet, Metro, ODOT and others to assess what it means and how we deal with the ever-increasing problem of congestion in Washington County. Because what happens in Tigard does have an effect on the roads throughout the county. We also have dedicated more money uh, from our transportation budget to bike and ped 
projects than, under my watch than at any time in the history of Washington County. Fully 20 to 25 percent of our county budget, our transportation budget now goes for bike and ped facilities. Many of them are, uh, are for projects that close sidewalk gaps in neighborhoods, making them a lot more livable. So the, I would always ask, how much is enough? If somebody advocates for more sidewalk funding, do they understand how much that we're spending now? That's a big question. I also want to talk about the Fairgrounds Master Plan. My opponent has characterized this as a trophy project. It would appear that he's unfamiliar about how the Fairgrounds Master Plan was created with input from Fairgrounds attendees, vendors, local governments, agriculture, and, and many more groups. It's been supported unanimously from the entire Board of Commissioners, veterans groups, the Visitors Association, and the Chambers. So when one calls it a trophy project, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that means. One aspect of the master plan is the proposed exhibit center. It's a, it will provide a much needed space for the annual fair, and frankly, when I look around in this room, boy, do we need space for meetings. Uh, <laughs> uh, the fairgrounds really belongs to all of us, and there's a great plan in place to complete most of it without any tax dollars, no public land being trade off, traded off. And those are values that the public has made very clear in the past. The Washington County Visitors Association has pledged a substantial amount from lodging taxes to help to accelerate the project. And since that money comes from hoteliers, we checked with the lodging association and hoteliers throughout the county were completely supportive. They recognized the ripple effect that this facility would have all the way down to Tualatin and Sherwood. And I'm proud that we're able to do this again without raising taxes. Another big project that's important to the county's future is the development of water resources at Hag Lake. I've made multiple trips to DC to advocate for this and was recently invited to testify before the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. With the help of our two senators and congresswoman, uh, I think that uh, we are starting to see a little bit of movement on this project and it's important that the relationships that we've built remain in place so that that pays off. Speaking of relationships, I've been endorsed by a number of different groups. I won't go into that, but um, uh, the, it, it includes everything from farm groups to development. So it's a broad range of folks. And I've said before, and I'll say it again, that if we don't stray too far to the right or the left, we will have a vibrant, livable community with a good mix of urban amenities and rural resources. A growing, diverse county, county providing job opportunities and living choices living lifestyles for all in the county. So I'm hoping that you will support me in my bid for re-election um, and uh, vote on May 20th for Andy Dyke for county chair. Thank you. You're on, go for it. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Eric. Uh, Thank you all for being here today. My name is Alan Amabiska, and I am a candidate for the Washington County Commission Chair. I thought I'd give you a background on who I, who I am and where I'm coming from. I have a wide-ranging, diverse background. I was raised on a farm here in Oregon, down in the Willamette Valley by Lebanon. I was the oldest of six kids, and my dad, because of, after the war, World War II, he didn't have much money. We started out that farm with very little. And he worked several jobs so he could buy the equipment. So at a very young age, I had a lot of responsibility. My job was to, besides convince my brothers and sisters what chores they needed to do, uh, I needed to make sure the animals were taken care of. We had herds of sheep, cattle. We had grain crops, so I was required to take care of the machinery. My dad, because of his part-time jobs and his swing shift job on the railroad, he wasn't around a lot, so I had a lot of responsibility, and I had to work really hard to earn his trust. One of the things he taught me was how to listen, how to respect people's opinions. He had a lot of patience, especially when I was young, on listening to my ideas and my opinions. There we worked together, and he taught me how to take care of a farm, how to manage the money carefully, how to take care of the animals, 
now to convince my brothers and sisters to do their chores. <laughs> well, in our senior year of high school, my dad became very ill, a life-threatening illness. And the doctors told him he was going to die within six months. So we had to sell that farm very quickly, unload it, sell all the animals, take what money we could get, and move to Arizona, where his family was at. So when he passed away, my mother and my five brothers and sisters, we'd have, we'd have a family to take care of us, because that's where all of his, his brothers and sisters were at. Well, good news. The change in climate was exactly what he needed. He survived. He actually lived to a very old age in Arizona, lived a good life. For me, though, we didn't have any more money to go to college. I had planned to go to Oregon State College because it was right across the valley at night. I could see the lights. And I had dreams of going over there and watching football games. Well, that dream died. So when I finished with high school, Typical, I looked around and said, what, do I, what should I be doing? And at that time, there was a draft. And so rather than wait and take my chances, I joined the service. And I went into the Air Force. And there, I listened to my commanding officers and my sergeants. At first, you had to listen. You had to be careful to listen. But you know what? I worked really hard. And I was trying to do a good job, and they knew it. And they would give me advice and they would tell me what I should try to do. Well, I had a good career in the military. For four years, I traveled the world, saw some very interesting things, and went through some very difficult times. But I always wanted to go to college. So after my service, I came out, went to college, worked my way through college, earned two degrees, one in finance and one in science, a botany degree, because of my love of plants, which I gained on the farm. After, after college, I went into the high-tech industry because a very young woman that I met in college gave me advice one day. She said, they're hiring in Silicon Valley. <laughs> and so for 40 years, I've been paying attention to that woman. That's Cherry back there. It's my wife in the corner. <laughs> so I went to California and started my career, continued working through college and finished up there. But there, I worked in all kinds of businesses in the high-tech arena. Worked at small companies, startups, worked in the big ones. Then, as Andy noted, we were very fortunate. We got an opportunity to move back to Oregon. It was a, it was a once in a lifetime shot and we took it. We came back here because we had two little daughters and there's one thing I wanted to do was have them come back here and be raised in Oregon. The wildlife, the fast-paced life of California was just not a good place for them. So here we came. Found a little house up on a hill. It was during the depths of the recession back in the late 80s. Found a little place with a sign down in the gully, down in the ditch beside the driveway saying for sale. And that's what we bought. It was a perfect little place for two little kids. And a wife who loved Oregon. So. From there, went into Intel. And there I just finished 21 years. I retired, I'm one of the few that made it. Uh, but what I did throughout my entire career is something that my dad taught me, which is to listen, to listen to others and respect their opinions. You may not always agree, but this is the only way you can find out if you're making the right decision to get the best solution for all. I listened to my peers my staff. I worked with business partners all around the world. As I went through my career progressing, I, I depended on other people's views. And if they had a better idea, I took it. I w ran with it, said that's what we need to do. Get their buy-in. You know what, it makes it a lot easier. You don't have to micromanage anything. When other people invest in the idea, it's their idea, they grow and develop. It's, it's actually refreshing. So this is what I bring to Washington County, my diverse background. My goals here are very simple. I'm going to listen with respect to the citizens and to the staff of Washington County. I'm going to do some other basic things. I'm going to end the sweetheart tax deals that are going to all the developers. That money needs to go back into the roads and sidewalks. 
We are building roads and sidewalks. We need to build more. The other day, I was just driving down one of their local roads. Kids are walking in the ditch next to a major thoroughfare. We've got to work on getting these kids in a safe place. Gain share. Here's another hot topic. Gain share is based on a valuable tool, our economic development tools. That money needs to go back to where property taxes were negatively impacted on certain core services. We've got to get it into our schools, our core services, and our public safety. And finally, the vehicle registration tax. That needs to go to a vote of the people. It should not be automatically imposed, especially when you're giving property tax breaks to the developers. We need to be fair with everyone. So in, so in hosting my final statement, together we can work and achieve a diverse, productive county. I am running for Washington County Commission, and I appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Folks will entertain a few questions. I ask that you keep the questions to about 30 seconds. And uh, uh, Jim, do you want to start us off? And uh, also, please direct your, your question either to one or both of the candidates. Um, Jim K. Four member, question for Andy. Uh, last time you spoke here, you were asked. I don't think it's picking up, is it? Well, it's, it's going to be on tape. OK. Um, last time you spoke here, you were asked about your vote to hire Allen for counsel. You said you don't know what Allen did at the city. That's the concern. Bad things happened at the city while Allen was there, including the Nike case, which wasted tax dollars, scared away jobs, and reduced local government credibility. Allen never apologized. So why didn't you perform proper due diligence in Allen's closed job interview process? Thank you. Excuse me, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you, uh, you referred to the city. I think you mean the county. Well, he worked at the city. Okay, um, and, and which, and, and which uh, city was I ever in charge of where I would have done due diligence on, on hiring him? You're hiring someone from a job so you would know what they did at their last job. That would be proper okay. due I, diligence. I, I believe what you're referring to is, uh, is the Rural Roads Operations and Maintenance Advisory Committee. No, he, but, he was with pardon? the city. He was the city attorney. But I had no, no dealings with the city. I'm but, sorry. But if you're hiring him, then you do proper due diligence. I, I'm, I didn't hire Alan. You voted to hire Alan for council. Oh, you're talking Alan Rappelier. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was confused also when you said Alan. <laughs> yeah, Alan, <I'm> <laughs> they've got us both a little mixed up here. Okay, Alan Rappelier, yes. Uh, you know, you, you've asked this question before, and I, I simply disagree with you. We did do dil due diligence, and I disagree with your assessment of, uh, of Alan's record, and I'm going to leave it at that. Harry Bodine for a member. <clears throat> Excuse me. Back in the snowstorm a month ago, I opened up the Valley Times and a long article in there about the Democratic Party wants to take control of Washington County. And uh, we have some Democrats on the County Commission. I just signed a nominating petition for Greg Malinowski. But this party taking control, you know, I, I look across the, the hills to Portland and Multnomah County where the Democrats have been running the show for 30 or 40 years. I'm not really thrilled. So what are, we, what are we gonna get if the Democratic Party takes control of Washington County? Alan? So let's be clear, it is a nonpartisan race. But what you're going to get is a, from me, from Alan Amabisca, is a, is a different perspective on things. I'm gonna just be focusing on investing in families and, and in this infrastructure. I'm going to make sure we're getting the monies to where the people are and what they need. I'm not, I'm not looking for a takeover by any party. This is basically a difference in viewpoint, and that's where we're going to go. And that's as simple as that. There's nothing more complex than that. Thank you. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it very much. Um, I think, Alan, I want to ask you a question because you're the candidate I'm least familiar with. I'm uh, president of the Aloha Business Association, and I wonder, with your experience out of state and with your experience at Intel, where is any government 
interface so that you understand how government works because I believe it's very different than business. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work as quickly as business, which is frustrating for all of us. So I'm wondering if you might share with us. I mean, it's good to listen. Yes. But things don't happen because you said so. You have to check and have to be collaborative. And so I'd be interested in hearing where your experience has been collaborative and where you've gotten results because of that and where your government experience is. Okay. Thank you. Good question. So as far as being collaborative, in the business environment I've been in, I actually had to work with very diverse people. One of my challenges that I had was given, because others were challenged by trying to figure out how to do it, was working with Malaysian Muslims on a project with Israeli Jews and Latin American young people. To get those three groups together, no one could quite figure out how to do it. What I did was I listened carefully to what they said, what were their interests, what were their concerns, defined what the project and goals were, and worked to figure out how we could get there. And that's exactly what we did. At the individual level, people understood the need to achieve certain goals, and we negotiated and compromised and figured out the right solution for all. As far as government experience, I've been a school board member. My kids went through the public school system here. I started out on the budget committee and planning committee. From there, I became a school board director and eventually the school board chairman, where I worked with the school's parents and the staff to try and provide the best education possible under the very difficult budget restrictions we had. And that's where I bring that to this position again. I'm going to listen and work with the folks. And yes, public, public processes are a lot different than private, but that I understand. And I will be working with the folks to do that. Thank you. Chairman John Platt from uh, <clears throat> Helvetia. Uh, the Court of Appeals took on the reserves decision of Washington County as well as Multnomah County and Clackamas County. In the case of Washington County, they found that the county had used pseudo factors, basically that the county had invented factors to classify soils. Uh, Helvetia repeatedly came in front of the county as well as in front of Metro and said, wait a second, you can't use those classifications, they're from 1982. The Court of Appeals said you couldn't use them either. They were pseudo factors. And as a result, throughout the entire metro process. Now, the first citizen advisory committee that was set up on the reserves process had only mayors in Washington County. In Clackamas County and Multnomah County, they had broad citizen participation. Farmers had one vote split, be split between two people and only after they had insisted upon it. Wouldn't you change now that you've seen what's happened? Would you do that again? Um, thank you for the question and the opportunity. And the answer is yes, I would do it again. Uh, because we have, to, we have to get down to, first of all, what it is we were trying to achieve. The urban and rural reserves process was supposed to be a process to set out a 50-year plan for where urban growth, urban growth could occur over 50 years and what lands were the best of the best in rural <laughs> lands where we could have some certainty where agriculture could uh, invest long term in their irrigation, their perennial crops, and, and the land with, without having to worry about where the next urban growth boundary was going to expand. Um, we set out to do that, and the first thing we did is, uh, is started to use the same process we've used for, um, for Goal 5 and, goal, uh, and Title 3, where we pulled in the mayors because they are directly responsible because they are elected, they are directly responsible to their constituency. And we, uh, we identified those lands which they would want for urbanization over 50 years, thinking about how their cities are gonna grow. At that stage, at that point in time, that's what was important. It wasn't the agricultural piece yet. It was wh what are the aspirations of the cities and what are their needs for a 50 year plan. Later on, we had all of the, the rural folks come in and everybody else from both sides. There were, there were as many different opinions as there were people. And we pared it down through a series of filters. Now the ironic thing about the so-called pseudo factors, which is the term that the, uh, the court used, what were those pseudo, pseudo factors? Well, one of them, the most important, was the fact that when it came down to figuring out agricultural land 
and what is the best of the best, we looked at Washington County and we said all agricultural land is important in Washington County. It really is. You can, you can grow something on just about anything, any place in Washington County. So you have to have something to narrow it down that is more than what the reserves legislation uh, required. So we used the reserves legislation, but we went one step further and we used irrigation as a means of narrowing it down and saying this is the best of the best. Because after all, the, irrigate, the Tualatin Valley Irrigation District and the Bureau of Reclamation have hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in that irrigation system. So that's land that we should set aside definitely as rural reserves. If we had not used those factors, we could have designated the exact same land that we did designate, only we would have said it, we, we do so because that's what we need for urbanization. But we wouldn't qualify it with saying it's not the best of the best on the farm side. But our mistake is that we went a little bit further and we applied a few more factors than what the legislation itself defined. Now LCDC agreed with us. They, they thought that was the, the appropriate thing to do. And you would think the state would get to determine that. But the courts chose otherwise. And frankly, um, that's where we sat today, is once the courts remanded it, we were left with no other option than to do some sort of a, uh, a compromise deal that would give us some certainty. But I, I still stand by what we did. I think it was the right thing to do. I think the courts made the wrong decision, but it doesn't matter. We live in America where the courts have the final say-so. And as long as folks are willing to litigate, then we have issues like this that we have to deal with. Questioners and candidates, please keep it quick so we can keep it moving along. Focused and short questions and answers, please. Chris Leslie, former member. What effective plans do you have to save the county money? Uh, are you asking both? One both of us. Both of you. Well, the, uh, my, my historical response to that has always been to get out ahead of the curve when we see a downturn in some, uh, some area. For example, as we saw the recession coming on, we actually laid off about 50% of the permitting department. We knew that there were going to be less permits, and we got out ahead of it. Unlike many other municipalities that wait until it's too late, we anticipate where we're going to be, and we try to make those cuts early so that they don't have to be as deep. Uh, that's, that is the way I've operated in the past, and it's the way I'll continue to operate. Thank you. So I've managed some very large operations and budgets. The goal here is appropriately aligning expenses with the revenue. So first off, using gain share funds, which is operational property tax money, for an event center that is a major capital project. After the voters have rejected the bond measures twice by overwhelming margins, is an inappropriate use of funds. We need to get the funds back to where they're supposed to be intended. If the event center, and I do agree, the event center does sound like a really good idea, it needs to be on a bond measure where you have secure funding to build that structure. You do not want to be using operational money for that event center and have an economic downturn, which could easily happen, and end up unable to complete that structure without severely <coughs> impacting the operations of the county. You need to be conservative with every dollar. Those are precious dollars. People, those are people's tax money. You cannot be affording to waste them because they're watching and they will take vengeance on the next bond measure you come out with. So we need to do that, carefully monitor our money, make sure it's going to our schools, roads, and our public safety. That's where I'm coming from. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, this question is for Andy, but if, if uh, Alan wants to uh, respond as well, then it's for both of you. Um, it was revealing in your last answer about how you constituted the advisory committee for, for urban and rural reserves that you presumed the primacy of cities and city aspirations over the significance of protecting land use. That in itself departs significantly from the legislation under which you, the statute under which you were operating. Um, 
you you have shown in lots of different situations your preference for working with the cities. You control quite carefully your the majority board majority controls quite carefully who gets to be on advisory committees and it's very seldom anybody who has a different opinion than yours. It seems to me that the citizens in the communities that are rural and that are urban unincorporated get shortchanged automatically by your set of priorities about where you want information to come from. How question. would you how how would you change this setup to get better information from those neglected parts of the county? Okay, um, I wouldn't, uh, because this is this is a representative democracy, and I trust the public to vote for people they want to represent them, and they voted for, I believe, thirteen different mayors, who sat on that committee. I myself advocated on that committee for representation from Farm Bureau. Otherwise, they would not have had a seat at that first, uh, first step. But keep in mind, this is a process that is multifaceted. It is urban reserves, and it is also rural reserves. And at that stage, we needed to know what those urban needs were going to be. Later in the process, we also needed to know what the rural needs were going to be. And we needed to reconcile those two. And it's very, very important that a leader of Washington County be able to reconcile those two and make hard decisions. Now, I can attest to the fact that had we done it differently, had we had representation very heavily early on that did not include the mayors but included a lot more citizen groups, we also would have had people on the other side who, who uh, said that we needed more urbanization. People who want to live in a single family home, they don't want to live in a high density, high rise apartment. We would have had a broad range of views. And ultimately we did get those and we got them on the record, but um, there was a process and at that point in time we needed the urban reserves to be, to be identified. Uh, very quickly, to respond to an earlier, the earlier comment about the fairgrounds, uh, yes, I agree that we should use gain share money for the fairgrounds, uh, but it's one, excuse me, gain share money is one time money and should not be used for programs because it does the very thing that my opponent said about um, going away and suddenly you have a program with people you've hired that now you get to fire. Is that smart? As far as building the building, we won't build the building until we do have the money. I agree with my opponent on that. And that's exactly the fiscal responsibility that I've shown in the past, and we'll continue to do so. Let's go to the last question. Please make a brief. Hello. Shaw Smith. I'm a new member. Uh, my question actually is about how, well, a blank check to developers or corporate interests can undermine the principles of land use planning. But as somebody that hopes to stay here and, and grow, I understand that land use planning is designed to control and responsible uh, development. Uh, with that in mind, could you please articulate your pro-growth philosophy, especially emerging from tough economic times while we're trying to implement things like the Affordable Care Act? So there's two aspects here. So number one, business support. I'm coming from a business background. I'm going to be supporting small businesses. That's the main focus. I would love to support all businesses, but we want small businesses because that's where 65% of all the jobs come from. So one of my goals is figuring out innovative ways to help those small business people start new companies and grow new companies. Perhaps looking at some sort of streamlining advocacy way that the, the current commissioner, the chair has mentioned has been done. We need to expand that because I've talked to some business people that are extremely frustrated with what's going on with getting the permits out. As far as land use, I'm for moving the urban growth boundary. I supported and was in favor of nearly 2,000 acres of that urban growth boundary. What I was not in favor of was ignoring the spirit and the requirements of the law. Senate Bill 1011 had very prescribed requirements. That is what the county chose to ignore. They brought in other unrelated uh, justifications, such as irrigation, which is not covered in the law. What's in the law is soil type. Irrigation is an artificial man-made issue. Soil type is what kind of soil is there. They wanted to know, and it's class one, class two are the highest levels soils. 
what, you, what we did and what the county did was spent four years ignoring what people were telling them, that they weren't following the rules, and wasted thousands upon thousands of individuals and staff hours, an untold amount of staff money, and ended up with a proposal for urban reserves that was rejected in its entirety by the Oregon Court of Appeals. Clackamas figured it out. Multnomah County figured it out. Washington County didn't figure it out and had to be saved by the state legislature. And I'm not quite clear if we've really been saved because now I, I have grave concerns that as soon as the next state legislature opens, we will have the equivalent of an Oklahoma land rush down I-5 by every developer and lobbyist ignoring Washington County. Why should they come here to ask for help? They're just going straight to the legislature. That will create untold costs for our transportation systems and infrastructure as they supersite properties across our lands. We've got to be careful here. We need good planning, we need good growth, we need opportunity, and that's what we need to have. Uncontrolled sprawl for jobs is a, is a job killer and a killer of our economy. Thank you very much. Well, let's see, my, my plan for, for uh, growth Let's, let's look at what we have today. Currently, we have 20 new jobs every day being, being uh, created here in Washington County. Those are not just high-tech jobs. Those are, those are small mom and pops, all the way up to the mid-size, all the way up to the large businesses. So I think I've already been successful in that area. But the question then is how you deal with that growth. I agree with my opponent about not having sprawl. I don't believe that what we have is sprawl, frankly. We're talking about, had, had the reserves been adopted in its entirety the way it had been proposed, we were talking about an 11% expansion over a 50-year period, 11% at a time when we will be doubling in population. Now, that's going to happen whether we like it or not. That population is going to double. Even during the recession, people continue to come here at phenomenal rates. So uh, I believe that we need to look at where we expand and make choices for the future so we can get out ahead of it and put in the sewer and the water and the roads that we need. But currently, with the remand, we don't have that sort of a plan. We don't have a 50-year land supply. What I would ask is why my opponent did not advocate for any land coming into the UGB if what he says is true. If he believes that we ought to have logical growth, why wasn't there an equal, um, equal comment about where we should grow as opposed to where we shouldn't grow? Again, it comes down to balance, and whoever is chair of Washington County should have that broad view. Folks, let's give these guys some applause. Thanks for being here. Let's shift gears, and I'd like to now introduce Brian Toski, HD 34. And let's give him a hand. Good afternoon, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you to Eric and the Washington County Public Affairs Forum for hosting this event and giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you today. My name is Brian Toski, and I am running for the open seat in House District 34. Today, I want to give you an introduction of who I am, why I've decided to run for office, and explain what I plan to do as the next legislator in House District 34. I grew up in a union household in Wisconsin, raised by parents who expected me to be an involved community member and to volunteer on a regular basis. As, a, as an adult, I have continued to volunteer with both political and social organizations, such as the Boys and Girls Club, Junior Achievement, the AFL-CIO, the Democratic Party of Oregon, Minds Matter, and Portland's Adopt the Class. When I moved to college, I had a unique opportunity to lobby the legislature to protect education funding. This experience reaffirmed my passion to be an involved community member, and it pointed me in a new direction. Being in the Capitol that day opened my eyes to the power 
and the possibility of the political process. Having gained a passion for politics, I continued my education at Portland State University, where I taught public speaking classes and other communication studies classes while obtaining my master's degree. Teaching at PSU fueled my fire and desire to work in the field of education. And while in school, I met my wife, Lindsay, who is a native Oregonian. Lindsay and I are both PSU alums, and we hope that our young children will follow in our footsteps. After receiving my master's degree, I continue to teach at colleges both in Wisconsin and in Oregon. My passion for politics collided with my passion for education. And I have dedicated the past 13 years to improving education in this country. I have spent the majority of my career in an educational professional services role, supporting teachers and administrators all across the country. These professional experiences have provided me with a unique perspective on recognizing both ineffective and effective school systems. And given the opportunity, I will work to ensure that Oregon has the latter. In the coming years, I will have kids in the Beaverton public school system. And as a father and as a community member, I want what you want a high quality public education system, the opportunity to work hard and find a job that pays a family wage, and most importantly, to know that the people down in Salem are looking out for the best interests of me and my community. I believe now is the right time for me to run for office. I believe government has the responsibility to support its citizens and provide the vital resources a community needs to thrive in the 21st century. I believe that education plays the biggest role in sustaining and strengthening our community and our citizens for both today and in the future. As a state representative, it will be my duty to make sure we give the next generation of Oregonians a high quality public education system and access to a job that pays a living wage, all while protecting our environment. My career has provided me with the experience of connecting education with businesses. And as a legislator, I will draw on this experience to improve our community. My priorities for education would be to decrease, cla decrease class size and restore vital programs. Increase school days so that Oregon does not have or continue to have one of the shortest school years in the country. Prioritize and invest in high quality pre-K through college education systems and provide students with a clear path for success from their classroom to their career. While Oregon's economy is starting to bounce back, it's critical that we continue to support our small and local businesses to help maximize job growth reduce high unemployment rates, and improve our economy. We can do this by providing incentives to expand and increase the workforce, understanding that infrastructure is key for job expansion, and acknowledging that businesses need an educated and skilled workforce in today's challenging economy. More than many other states, Oregon's environment is rich with natural resources. And as a father, I'm raising my two young children to protect, to teach them to protect Oregon's environment. As a legislator, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to tackle, tackle the serious problems we are facing today with innovative solutions and new ways of governing. When casting a vote, I will always make sure to represent the interests of our community, our families, our homeowners, and the businesses who invest in our communities. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Jason Yergel. How about a round of applause for Jason? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Yergel. 
I am a Democratic candidate for state representative in House District 34. When I was um, considering whether to run and thinking about the rigors of a campaign and what it takes to donate a year of your time and effort to doing this, I kind of thought back and it occurred to me an old line from Pat Paulson when he ran for president in 68. Some people in this room might be old enough to remember that. And it's something Pat said that struck me. He said, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Therefore, I've advised my campaign committee to begin fundraising immediately. <laughs> There's some truth to that, although it is kind of a funny line. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I have lived and worked in Washington County for almost 25 years. I'm the owner of a small business, Legal Pro Investigations, LLC. I provide investigative and litigation support services to attorneys in the metro area and, and beyond. Prior to that, for about a decade, I worked for the Metropolitan Public Defender's Office in downtown Portland. Uh, my involvement with District 34 began many years ago when I went door to door with and for Suzanne Bonamici when she was first running in House District 34 for a state representative. I've remained a supporter of hers ever since. When she was appointed to the Senate, my fellow Democrats had enough confidence in me that I was one of three individuals that they forwarded to the Board of County Commissioners as people competent enough to take her place. And I appreciated their confidence at that time. Since then, I've been involved and maintained a good record of public service in my community. I have chaired the Citizens Participation Organization number three for a number of years. That's West Slope, Garden Home, Raleigh Hills. CPOs were formed in Washington County as a way for the county to comply with goal one of its land use laws. And I have dedicated a large part of my public service to open governance, to public participation, and to transparency in government. And that's an ethic I will take with me to Salem. I have worked on several transportation committees here in Washington County very glamorous work on the Urban Roads Maintenance District Advisory Committee. I've also worked for the Minor Betterments Improvement Selection Committee. Uh, while doing that, I have come to believe very much in the value of maintaining our public infrastructure and the value in that. I think it's a wise use of public funds. I have been involved with identifying and securing funding for several projects, including safe routes to schools, traffic safety improvement projects, and the minor betterment projects. Minor betterments are simple things, a bike path here, a sidewalk there, uh, a crosswalk, a safe way to get to and from, a, the, from one side of the street to the other. Little projects, but things that really make a difference in the livability and safety of our neighborhoods. And I'm proud of that work as well. Uh, I have worked on several uh, public safety committees. Um, I've done ride-alongs in this district. I'm a graduate of the Washington County Sheriff Citizens Academy. I have also worked and been very involved with environmental issues. Uh, I've testified regarding development in Washington County in the Bethany area. I've been very involved in maintaining the cleanliness and improving the condition of our urban streams and environment. I have a sense that that's people in an environment such as ours really long for that connection with nature and they want it close to their home. They want a place that they can go and recreate and get in touch with nature without having to travel many, many, many miles. Um, I have, I think, a very good record of public service and I continue doing that. I've been on record since, since approximately 2008 saying that we must find a way to get more money for schools. I've been meeting with members of the school board here in Beaverton and discussing the issues most pertinent to them. It's not on my brochure, but I've also been given the endorsement of Ms. Leanne Larson, a member of the Beaverton School Board. One of the reasons uh, I wanted to get involved and run for House District 34 is the fact that we've all witnessed a carelessness with taxpayer dollars at the state level. We can talk about Cover Oregon, we can talk about the CRC, uh, the hiring of Rudy Crew, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that we owe it to the taxpayers to make the wisest and best use of those public funds, and that's something that you can count on my advocacy for if I'm given the honor of serving you in Salem. I have several endorsements. My endorsements cross party lines. My endorsements come from the people I've worked on committees with 
and been involved with and, in, and in shared in those debates. I have been endorsed by two of the members here today, people you've heard from, Mr. Andy Dyke, the chair of the County Commission, and Mr. Eric Squires, one of your own. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the two opposite ends of the political spectrum right there. <laughs> Make no mistake. And yet both gentlemen have chosen to endorse me. Why? Because I've shown an ability to work across party lines. Because I've shown an ability to seek solutions and not engage in bitter partisan conflict. I have the confidence of the people I've worked with and I hope to serve them continuing in Salem. We face a lot of challenges as a state. Our challenges are enormous. Tax reform, school spending, transportation priorities, and environmental protection. I believe I have the knowledge, leadership skills, and public service record to be an effective legislator for you. When the ballots come out, please vote for Jason Yergel, Democrat, House District 34. Thank you. It's a privilege to welcome Mr. Ken Helm, another candidate, and he is also very deserving of a round of applause. Please share that with him. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to be with you today. I wanted to cover three large areas. First, who I am. Secondly, my legislative priorities. And third, why I'm running for office and why I'll make a good legislator. First, who I am. I've lived in Beaverton for the last 10 years. We live near the intersection of 158th and Cornell in the Waterhouse neighborhood. Um, I'm married to my wonderful wife of 20 years, um, who has, uh, was a uh, lifetime Intel employee. Uh, she recently changed careers and went to WebMD, where she's a VP of marketing. We have two children, a 16-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old son. I've lived in Oregon for 35 years. I graduated from high school in Bend. And my mother uh, is a retired nurse, and my father's a retired county sanitarian. They both still live in Bent. I went to university at Willamette University in Salem, and I got a BA in political science and history. And while I was there in my senior year, I was able to do an internship at the state legislature um, with the Oregon Environmental Council. And while there, that was 1987, and that was the year that our current governor was still um, Senate president, and it was inspiring to watch him. After college, I learned the baking trade, and I was a baker for five years while I put myself through law school. Uh, I went back to Willamette University for law school, um, and it was there that I discovered land use law and became very passionate about it. Um, I won a clerkship to the Land Use Board of Appeals and clerked there for Mike Holston, uh, among, the, uh, uh, among the three other members of the board. Uh, Mike Holston's still there. My first job out of law school uh, was a medium-sized law firm where I did both development side work and work for municipalities advising them in land use. Shortly thereafter, I took a land use attorney staff position at Metro. And one of my first jobs out of the box was to defend the first urban reserve decision back in 1998. And I still have the scars to prove it. <laughs> that was quite an adventure and uh, it sent me further down the, the road in land use law and understanding the tensions that uh, are involved in setting a UGB and, and in general um, talking about land use issues. Since, 19, or since 2006, rather, I've had my own law practice. Um, I'm primarily a, a land use hearings officer and a code enforcement hearings officer for six jurisdictions around the state. And uh, that practice has allowed me to explore issues from the very mundane, such as why your neighbor can't have six resting vehicles in their yard, creating a nuisance, um, to discussing the highest level um, interpretations of state land use law in front of the Oregon Supreme Court. Most importantly, though, my job these days is about listening to people. Uh, that's, what I, that's what I do day in and day out. I hold land use hearings in which People from different perspectives give me their ideas and their concerns, and I have to weigh both sides of an issue continuously. And then I have to interpret and apply both state and local law to come up with the right decision. And doing the right job means reconciling tensions between neighbors. And this is particularly true in urban areas where we're starting to develop, to develop some of the last areas of our vacant lands. 
In running my own business, I've been given abundant time to volunteer in my kids' schools. And we've made education a priority in our family. I volunteered literally hundreds of hours in my kids' schools, everything from building a soccer field at my son's school and outdoor play areas there to organizing and, ru and running cultural and fundraising events in their schools and to providing uh, pro bono legal advice to the schools as they operate their facilities and look for new ones. My legislative priorities will be as follows. First, and these, these track the, the issues and the priorities of my district over time. First, secure and stable funding for our education system. Measure 5 has ravaged our state system. We need to find ways to get money back into our schools so that we can run them right for both kids and the administrators and the teachers. Access to high quality and affordable health care. We have a new health care landscape coming to us. We need to help folks navigate the Affordable Care Act and we need to keep an eye on our existing programs to make sure we're doing them right. As a small business owner, I also want to support small business. I know that it is sometimes complex to get through the regulations that face them. Finally, we need to make sure that we maintain a healthy and sustainable environment, particularly sensible land use planning. And that leads me to why I'm in this race. The recent dust up over the urban reserves caused me to take take a hard look at what's likely to come at us in the next legislative session. You know, it's not so much what happened with urban reserves, but the fact that the folks that have been against our land use program for years and years and years have sent up the howl that the system is broken and we have to fix it. That's code for dismantling our land use system. And that motivates me to run because we need folks to defend that system. Although it's not perfect and it can always use improvement, um, we can't forget that the system's not just about setting a UGB line. It's about protecting farms and farmers. It's about protecting timber owners and small woodlots. It's about protecting wild places, providing adequate recreation and housing for all of our citizens inside the UGB, and working on our transportation plan as we plan out to the future so our roads will serve our populations. Those are values worth fighting for, and that's what I want to do in the legislature. Thank you very much. If I could have all three HD uh, 34? 34. 34. 34 candidates up here. Forgive me, we went blank for a second. And as they're doing that, what I'd like to do is acknowledge Joseph Tyner. One of the things that this meeting sets the bar for is good sound. And Joseph has been our intern, making sure that we're crisp and clear and riding our fader. And I ask for a round of applause for Joseph Tyner. He's doing a great job back there. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Virginia. Kind words. Uh, please, if you're uh, at the, uh, uh, actually, I'm going to take one as a presidential decorum for one second. If you'll notice the laurels on the banner. Compositionally for the photography, we try to align the, the laurels so that as you ask your question, you look smart and important. <laughs> and that is my artful hint for those of us who are not smart or important to ask your question on the microphone so you can be heard. Jim, would you take it away? Ask your question. Um, Jim Cape, four member, question for Jason. Um, last summer, you interrupted a restaurant and disrupted citizens' meals. You seemed disrespectful to the restaurant employees and customers. And when citizens called your company to ask what exactly you were doing and what exactly you were trying to accomplish, your company didn't return the calls. So shouldn't citizens be concerned about your sincerity and motivations and your unprofessional company? Thank you. No, they should not be. Jim, I remember what the incident you're talking about. Uh, I was working as a private investigator at the time. I did an interview with an employee at, at a restaurant and through the course of that work, uh, I was able to get a very good result from my, from my uh, client. Uh, I received two phone calls from Jim. They were weird and strange and were not worthy of responding to, and I'll just leave it at that. Patrick Wheeler, forum member. I think the state supplies 80% of the school fund for all of districts in the state. And everybody wants to give more money for schools, okay. 
there's a limit on the budget. What are you going to cut to, and to bring up the amount going to schools, and what, what dollar amount per student are you going to go for? So when it comes to uh, education dollars, the first thing that I would like to do is thank the work that had been done in the past legislative session, the, the special session that everybody did, um, to get more funding for, for schools. And at this time, I think it's a, a, a good thing for us to step back and say, what is it we have and what we can do to make uh, changes for areas uh, as far as, as cuts. Clearly, people don't want to end up paying more taxes. I know I don't. I'm sure you don't. So it's important for us to get a good glimpse of what is available and where we can allocate different funds so that we can begin to start funding our schools in the manner that they need. Well, that's a great question, and I know that there are a lot of people that are concerned about school funding. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm a pragmatist. But I also believe in, in stating some truths. And one of the truths is we're not just going to be able to cut, cut, cut other programs in order to get enough money for schools. At some point, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. One of the tough decisions we might have to make is raising the corporate tax. It's very low. We're the 49th in the nation in corporate tax even a small percentage increase, if we were to move from something like 49th to 45th, would raise a whole lot of money. And there is broad support out there when you poll people and ask them about modest, not huge, not business killing, modest increase in the corporate tax, there's broad support for it. So I'm not going to start out from the mode of what should we have to cut. I'm going to start at the mode of you know, where can we more creatively get to funds? Should we close some loopholes? Should we consider increasing the corporate tax to get more money that we already need for everything? We're going to be having a discussion about tax reform in Salem in the coming session. And right now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the metaphor of the two-legged stool, which we have in Oregon. And we want to create a three-legged stool tax base, which isn't subject to the fluctuations of our economy. What's most important to me is to keep an eye out for any and the most regressive aspects of any proposed tax. Now, I may be really hurting myself here, but the sales tax has to be on the table. It has to be at least be willing to make it part of the discussion in any tax reform. We can talk about new sin taxes. There are other things that we can talk about a carbon tax and discuss the, the aspects of that and possibly implementing it. But my main concern would be to keep a watchdog uh, for the most regressive aspects of any new tax. And I, through my work, I've, I've visited people in their homes. I've seen how people, uh, many of us in our community are living day to day, struggling to stay in their homes. I've seen uh, elderly couples and singles in their home holding on to it. They are on a fixed income and they can't take any more rise in their property taxes. I will hold the line on property taxes. I would like to look for more creative ways to get money into schools. We have to do it. We have to get more money to our schools. I would like to see an expansion, for instance, of the Opportunity Grant Fund. These are individual grants that teachers and school districts can apply for across the state for individual projects or individual classes. We have, I don't know, I think right now a pilot project of I think 16 schools are participating. I'd like to see that expanded to 60 or 70 schools statewide. Last question. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, forum member. Thanks, you guys, for coming. Um, the last legislature uh, uh, tried to pass a bill referring an issue on legalization of marijuana to the voters, and it didn't make it. I was just curious. This is an issue that's not going to go away. I was just curious on, on your stance on that issue about the legalization of marijuana. This, this is an issue that uh, I've been thinking a little bit about, and I think it's an important one. It's not whether I would be for or against it. It's that it's coming. It's coming to a state near us soon, OK? And as legislators, we need to look forward, not just say that it's coming, but what are we going to do about it, OK? And there is a lot that we need to get ready to do. And there are two Petri dishes going on in our country right now, Washington 
and Colorado where we can learn a lot about their struggles to do it, regulate it right, cite places where we're going to sell marijuana, and deal with all the perceived and real social ills that may come along with it. Getting out ahead of that, uh, that curve is going to be really important. We have, uh, we've had a minor skirmish with the issue just recently and the legislature passed uh, authorized local governments to regulate the location of dispensaries. That's been a number one issue for planners, for planning directors throughout the state. And I know from talking to the planners that I uh, work with that that is the case. Figuring out the right place for dispensaries, just like we would need to figure out the right place for, for um, marijuana um, stores eventually, is a critical issue. And what I thought uh, the Beaverton City Council did a really good job of was saying, we just need a timeout here. We're not going to say we're going to ban the stores or the dispensaries in our community. We need a moratorium. And that is a planning concept that has been used over and over that's a timeout that says let's step back let's think carefully about this and come up with a plan before we go out and do it and I think that was a good decision on their part we should be looking far ahead on this issue and see what we can learn from the other states go ahead. so when I look at this issue I look at it as it, it in a very similar manner uh, to, to Ken's and that I think the more proactive we can be to find out what we can do, how we can implement this the best and looking at the experiences from both Washington and Colorado will do us a, a, a good service and I think we need to be mindful on what that could look like for us uh, both in the short and long term. I'm not a big fan of sin taxes but Colorado just realized $2 million in new tax revenue from its legalized marijuana program in one month. I think the same is possible here in Oregon. I think uh, legalization of marijuana should be put to a vote of the people of Oregon. And if they choose to do that, I think it would be the responsibility of the state legislature to make sure we implemented it and taxed it at an appropriate rate so that we will have a new source of revenue for all the programs, including schools in this state. Thank you. Up here for just a little bit. Folks, I would like to ask some applause for all these amazing speakers. I'd like to conclude today's meetings with a few brief announcements. First, our programs will be uh, available online at uh, our YouTube channel. You can link to that off of our website, which is WashingtonCountyForum.org. We podcast the, this uh, event, and that is at pod, or WashingtonCounty.Podomatic. Dot com. And at our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Washington County Public Affairs Forum, we'll have the photos from today's event and links to the YouTube videos as soon as we can possibly get to them. I'd like to also thank you for not throwing anything at any of the candidates. Um, <laughs> Um, we, um, but what you guys didn't know until right now is that uh, I installed electronic heckler control, which is sound effects, and so I was going to queue up sound effects to embarrass anybody or drown them out in case they got out of hand, and thank you for not making me do that. Uh, you're welcome. So, uh, yeah, I'm not kidding either. I got cow noises, I've got the phasers from Star Trek, and I can obliterate any heckler. And uh, these are just the technology uh, uh, skills that have been installed in the forum since uh, I took over. Thank you. And come back next week. We've got uh, the conclusion of the, uh, of the, the, uh, the forum season will be all politics. And uh, it's all politics, folks. So go home, drive safe, be well. Bye-bye.